Hi, everybody. Welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about one of the most important algorithms in quantum computing, specifically phase estimation. So let me share my screen and jump into a new section. So the basic idea behind phase estimation is as follows. Consider the following problem. You've got a unitary matrix U. And further, at least for simplicity, we'll begin by assuming that we've got a quantum state that's of the form uh, phi such that u acting on phi is equal to e to the i phi phi. Okay, so that's our, our setup. And our, prob our task is to learn phi. And ideally, we'd like to learn phi with a probability of failure le um, less than or equal to delta and error less than or equal to epsilon for any two values of delta and epsilon greater than zero. So let's see how we can do this. And the trick that we're going to use to do this is the fact that actually the quantum Fourier transform um, can be used in order to transform phases into bit strings. And that is exactly going to be the, how we end up doing this. So in particular, let's imagine that we had um, the, I'm going to make life a little bit simpler to begin with in order to make this kind of gel nicely with the quantum Fourier transform. And the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to assume that e to the i phi is equal to e to the two pi i k divided by two pi uh, for some uh, positive integer k, okay? So, the question is how, well, how do we estimate it? Well, the, the key to estimating it is, let's actually just take a look at what the quantum Fourier transform acting on K is. By definition, the quantum Fourier transform on N quantum bits uh, acting on K is one over root two to the N, sum from J equals zero to two to the N minus one of E to the two pi I K, j divided by two to the n j. So what this says is this says that if we could, oh, and I guess to simplify things, let's actually uh, expand this out. And we can see that this is actually one over root two to the n, sum over j equals zero to two to the n minus one, uh, e to the two pi i, uh, divided by uh, two to the n, and I think I should put a k up here, to the jth power j. So that means that if we can prepare this particular state and apply a inverse quantum Fourier transform to that, then this inverse quantum Fourier transform acting on this state, because it was performed by the quantum Fourier transform, will just map us back to k. So our problem of doing phase estimation essentially is to transform, create this particular state. And then once we've built that state, we can apply the inverse quantum Fourier transform to learn what the um, uh, value of K is. So that's the entire idea. And in order for us to be able to do this, um, it, it's actually really helpful to notice uh, some properties that we can, we can do. So let's consider the state phi and J1 coming into the following quantum circuit. We're just gonna take the single bit J1 and control the unitary U acting on this. And what does this end up doing? Well, this will end up firing U if and only if J1 is one. So in, uh, in other words, this circuit will map phi J1 to, um, e to the i uh, phi um, phi j1 if j1 equals one and phi j1 otherwise. Now this piecewise statement, it's actually pretty easy to check that this piecewise statement actually can be rewritten as um, e to the i phi times j1 uh, multiplied by phi and j1. Okay, 
And you can see this because if J1 is zero, then the exponent is zero, and hence we get one, which matches that. And if the uh, J1 is one, then the exponent is one and matches that. So that is how um, we can end up expressing this. Now let's go through the exact same sort of thought process on the following. Let's say we put in two integers in here, J1 and J2, okay? Oh, I guess one other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write this actually in a slightly stupider way. I'm going to write this as e to the i phi j1, 2 to the 0 phi j1. And the reason why, you, you'll see it in a sec with this example. So if we do our controlled unitary now, u, and then controlled on this one, I'm going to apply u twice, which is equivalent to u squared. Okay, so that's uh, by which I'm just saying that if we do u, u, so two controlled unitaries one after another, this is exactly the same thing as control u squared. Okay, so this is what we have. Now, using the exact same notation, this circuit will map phi j1, j2 for any arbitrary uh, bits j1 and j2, um, this will end up mapping this to e to the i phi uh, j1 times 2 to the 0 plus j2 times 2 to the 1. OK? And this is going to be phi j1 j2. Now, if we apply the same thing, it's easy to prove inductively that what we have is we've got, if we have J1, J2 going all the way down to Jn, and all of this, uh, of course, having a state phi up here, we're going to do this. Okay, and then finally, ending with um, I'm going to write this, I guess, is u 2 to the 0, u 2 to the 1. And then the last one is going to be u 2 to the n minus 1 from that. Then this particular state, just following the exact same pattern, and again, this can be formally proven inductively, we'll end up mapping our state to e to the i phi. Uh, J1, 2 to the 0, plus J2, 2 to the 1, plus so on and so forth, plus Jn, uh, 2 to the n, minus 1, uh, phi and J. Now, if you take a look at this, J1 through Jn, these are all uh, individual bits that we end up having in the binary expansion for, for n. And in this particular case, we can view this as a binary encoding of the bit string j. I, I suppose this would be what's known as a big endian because the most significant bit in this representation is this one down here. And the least significant bit is that one up there. But okay, so that is the, um, that is the representation. So if we take this representation, then this is just actually equal to e to the i phi j, phi and j. And in our language, this is actually also equal to e to the two pi i j k divided by two to the n phi j. And the reason why was because of the fact that we assumed previously this. Okay, so just using that substitution, putting that in our, our result gives us that. So now we can see that if we apply this circuit over here, um, okay, I'm going to call the circuit, I don't know, Q. So if we apply Q to our, our particular uh, state J, we'll end up getting um, this over here. So then the question is, what happens if we apply Q to Hadamard tensor N 
zero phi. Well, then this is the same thing as applying Q to the sum over J, one over root two to the N, J tensor phi, which is equal to, of course, using the, substituting this result in, we end up getting that this actually ends up giving us one over root two to the N sum over J e to the two pi i j k divided by two to the n, just substituting this relation in for each of the sum ends using li the linearity of this operator, we get j phi over here, okay? Which I can write as one over root two to the n sum over j um, e to the two pi i j k over two to the n j tensor phi, which of course is equal to um, the quantum Fourier transform acting on a bit string over here. This is an n bit string that ends up encoding the, the, the value k and tensor root phi. So therefore, if we apply QFT inverse to this result, what we're gonna get, end up getting is we're gonna end up getting k and phi. So the cool part about this is that what happens, if you think about it, is we started here with an eigenvector, okay? Now, what's happening is that after applying this transformation, we end up having an eigenvector tensored actually with all of its eigenvalues. And so the circuit that I'm going, uh, going to refer to as uh, PE, this, if we wanna view this as a quantum circuit, this quantum circuit can be uh, expressed as following. Let's say we put in phi up here, and then we've got zero over here. We then apply Hadamard's to zero. We feed that all in to the circuit Q that I drew, uh, drew above, where Q is these exponentially controlled uh, unitaries like that. And then finally, what we do is we feed that into QFT, and then the resulting bit string that we have down here is K. Okay, so now let's assume that instead of this being just a single, single value like this, we end up having that uh, a complete set of, uh, of observables. So if we express U in terms of its eigenbasis, let's just define U phi K. And this is just, I'm just gonna uh, set this to be equal to, or I guess E phi K is perhaps confusing. Um, let's call it phi P. And so this acting on it will be E to the I phi P phi P, where this is the P eigen vector in some canonical ordering of the eigenvectors. It, it kind of doesn't matter which canonical ordering we take. So if we assume that this is the case, then we have from linearity that for any phi p, p e acting on phi um, on zero, phi p is actually going to end up giving us, oh, and I guess, um, e to the i phi p, I'm going to assume is always equal to e to the two pi um, kp divided by two to the n. So if I do that, then what do I have in this first register? Well, I'm going to have that this is kp phi p over here, just following the exact same derivation that we did before. So in general, if we have a quantum state, an arbitrary quantum state, that's of the form, sum over j, uh, a j, uh, zero, phi j, then p e by linearity acting on this will 
map that to sum over j, aj, pe acting on zero phi j. Okay, fantastic. And then just using a definition of that, this is equal to the sum over j, aj, uh, k, um, j, phi j. So we see that even if we have a superposition of states, something kind of magical happens with the phase estimation algorithm. We get that exact same superposition, but what we have for every eigenvector, we have a bit string encoding e to the i 2 pi kj divided by 2 to the n in this register off to the side. So what this does is this actually gives you a way of kind of transforming to the eigenbasis of an arbitrary operator. Because each of these bit strings will mark a particular eigenvector. So you can use this not just in order to learn the eigenvalues because kj directly encodes the eigenvalues, which are these guys, but also measuring kj will project you onto the corresponding phi j. So this gives you a way of performing a measurement or a projection onto the eigenvectors of an arbitrary unitary, which is an incredibly powerful ability. Now, that is um, how this all works, but the question is, what's the cost? The cost of doing this is we needed um, two to the n, um, we need a two to the n applications of u. We needed one quantum Fourier transform, and we needed n Hadamard gates. The quantum Fourier transform, this will require order n operations. So it's typically going to be, uh, or order n squared if we use the method in class that is going to be subdominant to the two to the n uh, applications of u in most contexts. So this will be negligible in, most, uh, in almost all contexts. This is totally negligible. This is the dominant cost. So then the cost, at least certainly, the, certainly what is true is the query complexity is in the number of queries that we need to um, queries to you, it can be given by sum from j equals zero to n minus one of two to the j. Just going at the query, the, the, the layout of the q operation, we see the first one requires two to the zero u's, the second one requires two to the one, going all the way up to two to the n minus one. Fortunately, this is one of the very, very few sums that I know how to do. <laughs> this guy is actually just equal to 2 to the n minus 1. So therefore, we need order 2 to the n queries to um, learn phi to n bits. And so if we want to convert that to epsilon, our uncertainty in this, well, actually, in this case, we know it precisely. So we don't really need to worry about our uncertainties. Our uncertainty in this for these values is zero, and our probability of failure is also commensurately zero. So this is how we can the, how the quantum Fourier transform ends up working at a high level, and this is probably the most important thing to understand. So if you've once you've got that, then the next part that's actually that's really relevant is the question of okay, well, what if um, e to the i phi is not equal to e to the 2 pi i k divided by 2 to the n for integer k. All right, and then the question is, well, what, what do we need to do next in this particular case? And the answer is, everything actually works the same thing uh, works the uh, same, but we have a failure probability that actually ends up coming in. 
And so we have to go through and figure out um, how bad the possibility of failures can end up being if the value of k is not precisely um, an, an integer. So uh, in particular, um, let's actually go through and take a look at our circuit. So if we go through and we you know, begin with our state, and I'm going to assume for simplicity that we have just a single eigenstate coming in, then what we have is we have J1 through Jn going down here. We, of course, had a Mar transform. Incidentally, using the properties of Fourier transforms, actually, you can end up seeing that these Hadamard transforms, this is the exact same thing as doing a QFT on zero. And by the way, I made a mistake here. Sorry, these shouldn't be J1 to JN. That's how we're going to be interpreting them. The algorithm begins with these registers zeroed. Then what we do is we apply our Q matrix, which was this guy over here going down to U two to the n minus one. And this is that thing we called Q. And then we feed these results into the inverse quantum Fourier transform. And our result then follows. So that is the, um, that is the circuit that we want to actually carry out. And um, if we go going through the math, what we end up getting is uh, we end up getting that this is equal to QFT inverse one over root two to the N sum from J equals zero to two to the N minus one, uh, sorry, minus one's down here. And then E to the I J phi J phi. Okay, so now what, um, what, we, what we can do is we can um, actually use our expression for the inverse quantum Fourier transform. Uh, the inverse quantum Fourier transform acting on this, it actually just gives one over two to the n, sum over j and j prime, e to the i j phi, just exactly that first, that last term that we had before, multiplied by e to the negative two pi i, um, j prime j divided by two to the n uh, j prime phi. Now we're going through more algebraic steps here because before we could just say that this was exactly a Fourier transform. So we didn't need any extra algebra to, to, do, a, to do this in the end. But because this state is no longer precisely the quantum Fourier transform of something. We need to actually go through the extra algebraic steps to figure out or bound the impact of what the inverse quantum Fourier transform will do to the approximate state here. Okay, so that is how, how this ends up working. And we can expand this guy out actually in the following way. We can expand this out to be sum over um, j prime alpha j prime j prime phi, where alpha j prime is actually just equal to uh, e to the um, two pi i divided by two to the n. Um, J prime um, prime minus um, J phi over two pi times two to the n to the J divided by, oh, I actually, I made a mistake here. Yeah, that is more writer, uh, divided by uh, two to the n. And um, yeah, sorry, and there's a sum here. Sum from J equals zero to two to the n minus one. Okay, so I've just taken the J sum and all the rest of this junk inside and defined it to be alpha J prime. So 
that is uh, it more or less at a high level. Now, the rest of the steps in the derivation end up actually going through and just proving some elementary bounds on alpha, uh, alpha j prime. So the first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to assume specifically, uh, I just want to reiterate the fact that in this derivation, we, I'm going to assume j prime is not equal to phi 2 to the n uh, divided by 2 pi. Okay, That it matches our assumption that we want to study the case where this is an approximate um, quantum, it's a state that's close to the quantum Fourier transform, but not the quantum Fourier transform of some integer state. So uh, then the reason why we're going to want to do that will be apparent in a second. So I'm going to assume that, that that's true. Now, if I assume that that's true, then actually what we can do is we can use this, the geometric sum formula in order to simplify our expression for alpha j prime. So alpha j prime using this actually uh, can be expressed using um, the following. This is e to the negative two pi i divided by two to the n, j prime minus phi two to the n divided by two pi. Okay, um, all raised now to the, um, to, to the nth power. Uh, divided by the common ratio between all of these, which is uh, one minus e to the negative um, two pi i uh, over two to the n j prime minus uh, phi. Just give me a sec here. Yeah, okay minus phi uh, two to the n divided by two pi. Okay, so that's what, uh, what we, we end up getting. Oh, and uh, this is of course still divided by one over two to the n. Now in absolute value, we can actually just use a triangle inequality to say that this is less than or equal to one over two to the n two divided by the absolute value of one minus e to the negative two pi i divided by two to the n, uh, j prime minus phi two to the n divided by two pi. Okay, then using some elementary arguments from calculus, you can show that this function can be linearized um, in the following way. Uh, we can, linearize it you know, to end up getting the following bound. Uh, we end up getting one over two to the n, two over uh, one minus e to the two pi i divided by two to the n, um, j prime minus phi two to the n divided by two pi, absolute. Value. Oh, sorry, I skipped a step there. I went back a step in my notes. Okay, actually the bound that I intended <laughs> to write is that this is less than or equal to, it turns out, uh, one half uh, in brackets, one over absolute value of j prime minus phi two to the n divided by two pi. Okay, and the reason, reason why is that basically what we're doing is we're using a linearized approximation to this guy under the assumption that this angle that we have in here is bounded, of course, between negative pi and pi. Under that assumption, we can end up um, using a linearized approximation, which ends up giving us this uh, uh, down down here. So it just really follows directly from a Taylor uh, theorem argument. So in any case, this is what we end up having for uh, an upper bound on our coefficients for the alpha j prime. Now the probability, now, now that we've got an upper bound on the alpha j prime, we our next question is, what is 
the probability of failure. And what is the error? Okay, so we're going to consider a discrete, uh, because we naturally when we measure phase estimation, we're going to consider a, um, we're going to consider a value of a range of k. Okay, so first thing that I want to do is I wanted to find uh, the round, the rounded value of phi times two to the n divided by two pi. I'm going to define this to be b. So this is the closest integer value to the actual phase that we end up getting in, in this encoding of the phases as an integer. So that will correspond to a value b on a number line. Now I'm going to take our maximum tolerable error to be an integer in this, uh, in this language e. And so basically anything inside the range b plus e to b minus e, all of this stuff is good. And everything outside of this interval is bad. So in particular, the value b plus e plus one going all the way up to the end. And similarly, um, b minus e minus one over here going down to the end. That's all, that's all bad, okay? So then basically what we end up getting is we end up getting that the probability of failure, okay, is, and this is of course unhappy, probability of failure is just the probability that we end in one of, um, yes, one of these regions over here, okay? And so the probability of failure for that is just going to be equal to um, the sum over j prime um, less than um, b minus e alpha j prime squared plus the sum of j prime greater than b plus e alpha j prime squared. All right. So that is our, uh, our expression for the probability of failure. The result now is going to end up following actually just from some relatively straightforward exercises in um, norm inequality. So first, what we have is substituting everything in, we end up getting, let's deal with this one over here. This we can end up writing as uh, less than or equal to one quarter, the sum from L equals E plus one to two to the N um, minus one minus uh, E minus one. Okay, absolute value of um, Okay, or actually, let me, I skipped a step here. Let me back it up a bit to make this a little more understandable. So this term in here now is actually uh, going to be, well, less than or equal to using our bound that we ended up having before. That's going to be less than or equal to one quarter sum from J prime greater than or equal to um, B plus E plus one of one over j prime minus phi two to the n divided by two pi absolute value squared, just by squaring that particular result. Okay, cool. So furthermore, actually, we can make this even simpler. We've got some upper bound that we could potentially worry about, or we could actually say, let's upper bound that by the sum over everything. So sure, it's an, it's a, and this isn't going to be as tight of an upper bound because I'm taking, taking the upper limit to be infinite, but because this series is a convergent series, we don't, we'll only lose at worst a constant factor by uh, taking the end point of the sum to be infinity rather than some finite value. And also it'll, it'll, make, it'll make life just a little bit easier for computing the sum. 
Okay, cool. Now, the next thing that I want to do is I want to actually write, rewrite the sum in a slightly different way. I'm going to want to rewrite this from the point um, J prime equals B. So I'm going to let L it, uh, equals um, J prime minus B. And then if I do this, then the sum in terms of L ends up becoming sum from L um, equals E plus one to infinity of one over the absolute value of L minus um, phi over two pi two to the N minus B squared. Okay, now the error between the distance between these two is um, greater than or, or sorry is less than or equal to one because B is the ra rounded value right so let's say B is this guy, this is the actual value so worst case scenario the distance between these two is less than between here and here is less than uh, or equal to one. So therefore, we can end up saying that this is, of course, less than or equal to one quarter sum of L equals E plus one to infinity of one over L uh, minus one squared. All right, cool. So now we can use the integral summation formula and use the fact that if we have a monotonically decreasing function, and we would like to be able to do a discrete sum, then the discrete sum of this monotonically decreasing function, this would be like, say, x, right? Here, this would be like 0, 1, 2, 3. We can see that the sum upper bounds the uh, integral, because the integral is the area under this curve, and the sum is the integral under that curve. So the sum is strictly an upper bound on the integral. But this is annoying because we really would like to be able to use an integral because integrals are actually a lot easier to do than five discrete sums in general. So we're going to want to upper bound the uh, sum with the integral. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to say, ah, well, what we can do is actually, if we end up shifting this, uh, this series, what we can what we can do is we can say that the integral is going to actually be uh, upper bounded, or the sum is going to be upper bounded by this integral, which is really just found by shifting the curve over to the right. And so the way that we can do that basically is just by um, just by shifting our index by one. And so this ends up uh, being equivalent to the integral from e to uh, infinity of one over uh, L minus one absolute value squared DL, which of course is equal to uh, one quarter one over uh, E minus one. Okay, and so that upper bounds this part over here. The lower part, I'll spare you the derivation, but it's basically exactly the same. The lower part, the lower um, sum has a probability of failure that also can be upper bounded by one over four times one over E minus one. And therefore the total probability of failure which was equal to, again, the sum of a J less than um, B um, minus E minus uh, one, uh, alpha J uh, squared plus the sum of J greater than B plus E plus one, alpha J squared. This is less than or equal to one over four E minus one plus one over four E minus one equals one over two E minus one. Okay, so this ends up giving us our bound on the total probability of failure. Now we wanted the total probability of failure to be um, 
less than or equal to delta. So this is our target probability of failure. So the way that we'll solve this is we'll just say, okay, well, let's set this equal to delta and figure out what E would have to be in order to be able to get this. What we find from this is we end up finding that it suffices to, to do the following, that uh, one over two E is less than or equal to one over two E minus one, which we're gonna demand is less than or equal to delta. Therefore, it suffices to take E is um, greater than or equal to one over two delta. Wonderful. So this gives us a value of um, E that we can tolerate, i.e. a width inside this regime in terms of in in integers that will allow us to be safe and make sure that we get some estimate that's inside the happy region in here. Now, bear in mind, the happy region doesn't imply that we're going to get B either, right? Ideally, we would get B, but we're only actually promised to get a value within plus minus E of B if we end up in the happy region. So how do we, um, how do we convert that? So we end up getting that our value of our, our error epsilon, uh, this is going to be equal to the maximum value over um, um, of two pi b minus e over um, two to the n. Okay, so that is equal to our value of epsilon, right? So if uh, we we set this to be maximum value over, I guess e prime then the value of epsilon that we get is actually, this is um, two pi of B minus E over two to the N. And of course we wanna solve this for epsilon. So this ends up giving us, of course, uh, two pi over two to the N, um, or sorry, I guess I should say that the error that we want, the, di the distance between them, is going to be actually uh, the max over E. Yeah, all right. So I explained this really poorly. Give me a sec. Hopefully erasing will work. Okay, so what basically what we have is we have our estimates for our phase, right? Our phases are going to be between B over here and B plus E, as well as B minus E. Now, if we convert these integers into the corresponding phases, then the phase at this value is going to be two pi b over two to the n. And the value over here will be two pi b plus e divided by two to the n. So the maximum error that we can get is the maximum difference between these two. And so the maximum error that we're looking at is going to be two pi over two to the n b plus e minus b, which is just equal to two pi e divided by two to the n, which we take to be equal to choosing the minimum choice that we can get away with from this. We end up getting that this is um, two pi over uh, two, two to the n um, delta is equal to epsilon. And so then we can satisfy this by choosing n uh, to be equal to log pi over epsilon delta. And so then the cost, as we mentioned, the cost of doing this simulation is in order two to the n which is of course in order one over epsilon delta. So this shows that we can end up doing phase estimation uh, in an approximate sense, where there's some now probability of failure that we end up getting for each of the individual ones. This is delta is our probability of failure and epsilon is our accuracy. Now I should note that in practice, the probability of failure we usually will pick this to be um, less than or equal to say one third. 
The reason why, and I've alluded to this before, is that if we have a probability of failure that's less than one half, um, then we can use the Chernoff bound to amplify um, to arbitrary, arbitrarily small delta. So the way that basically this ends up working is we end up taking order log one of um, PE experiments with, let's call it delta prime, with delta equals uh, one third. Okay, and then once we've uh, we've done that, then we end up computing the median of the result, and with high probability, if you take it with probability um, less than or equal to delta prime, this procedure will end up giving you a, an estimate that's correct within error epsilon, and the total cost for doing this because we need to repeat the process order log a one over delta times is going to be order log one over delta prime divided by epsilon times delta. Now delta is one third here, so that disappears. So by using this Chernoff bound based trick to amplify the probabilities, actually we can get rid of this really bad delta scaling and replace it with the logarithmic scaling. However, the epsilon scaling that we've got here is actually optimal, it turns out. We can't get any better than one over epsilon. All right, cool. So thank you very much. Uh, hope you enjoyed and uh, see you all next time.